Elizabeth Cummings. I am the Newberry's Public Programs Manager. Um, the Newberry, for those of you who are new, is an independent research library, free and open to the public. Um, all you need to do is come in and get a reader card and you can head upstairs. Um, we have plenty of material for you to research regarding Art Deco in Chicago. Um, we have a lovely research guide created by our librarians, um, especially for tonight's lecture. So grab one of those on the front table. We also have, um, we're starting to debut our list of programs for the fall, uh, the spring, which I know you're all eagerly awaiting. So um, through the end of February is on the other info table. Um, so grab one of those. So tonight we welcome Robert Brugman, editor of this massive six uh, pound volume called Art Deco Chicago. The text will be available in our bookshop um, after the program. It is lavishly illustrated with 325 images. Um, and it's narr it narrates Art Deco's evolution in 101 key works. Um, all of those are detailed in essays by uh, separate contributors, too. So this was a huge, massive effort um, all over the city. Um, the key works are examples of a style that created an entire visual universe that extended to architecture, advertising, household objects, clothing, and even food design. Through the book's comprehensive approach to cataloging one of the 20th century's most pervasive modes of expression in America, Art Deco Chicago provides an essential overview of both the influential style and the metropolis that came to embody it. Mr. Brugman um, is an historian and critic of architecture, landscape, preservation, urban development, and the built environment. He's the distinguished professor emeritus of art history architecture and urban planning at the Univers University of Illinois at Chicago. He's written numerous books and articles, including the award-winning volume, The Architects in the City, Halliburton and Roche of Chicago, 1880 through 1918, the controversial Sprawl, A Compact History, and most recently, The Architecture of Harry Weiss, who is also the architect of the Newbury Stacks building, the building you've never been in. Um, he's also a frequent lecturer, contributor to magazines and blogs, and a guest on radio and television shows. So please join me in welcoming Mr. Brugman. Thank you very much, Elizabeth, and um, good evening, everybody. Very nice to be here. Uh, we're all set here. Um, I thought that this evening uh, I'd tell you a little bit about this book, um, how I came to it, and um, tell you a little bit about the content of it. Here I am, uh, shortly, <laughs> shortly after I arrived here in Chicago to uh, take up a job at University of Illinois at Chicago Circle, as it was at the time. Um, when I arrived here as a um, eager young architectural historian, I found there was almost a universal agreement about the place of Chicago in the history of modern design. Now, it was almost um, exclusively in architecture that Chicago had really gotten this reputation. And in the accepted playbook, there were three acts. Act number one, on the left-hand side there, Louis Sullivan, John Root, Daniel Burnham, Bankmar Adler, the so-called first Chicago school. Act two, 1893 World's Fair comes along and does this terrible thing um, where New York architects bring in historical styles and everything goes downhill for the next 30 years. <laughs> Act three, uh, the arrival of European emigres like Mies, and Maho Mies van der Rohe and Maholi Nagy, uh, they come and they rescue it, they look back to the great uh, Chicago tradition, and they create these new buildings in the so-called second Chicago school, often called international style buildings. Now, this narrative uh, was actually codified in the 1930s and 40s by historians and critics like Nicholas Pevsner, the German who then went to um, Britain, and uh, Siegfried Gideon, a Swiss historian. They imagined 
a architectural history that was based in almost entirely on the idea of a succession of avant-garde. Avant-garde's a military term for those troops that went out in advance to see what was coming. So they wanted to reject all convention, all of the historical styles, to start completely afresh and do an architecture based on nothing but program and structure. So this was the, the work that they were championing, was the work of people that came from the Bauhaus, architects like Gropius, Mies, and uh, Le Corbusier. Now, this view of architecture um, was a standard one by the 1970s, and it paralleled, it came from, actually, um, the kind of history that we've had on the history of painting and sculpture. And in this history, the same kind of of trajectory of avant-garde from Cezanne, um, who would rebel against the so-called terrible um, academic painting of the 19th century, uh, to Picasso and Cubism, and then to complete abstraction with, for example, Jackson Pollock after World War II. Now, the claim for Chicago um, was put forth most forcefully by this man, uh, Carl Condit, professor at Northwestern, and this book, um, the Chicago School of Architecture. And you can see just from the cover here what the story is. First Chicago School, second Chicago School. So Carl Condit believed that Chicago was the birthplace of the skyscraper, um, and won't get into that story, but also the birthpla birthplace of modern uh, architecture. And this was really important when he wrote this because Chicago at the time was reeling economically, seeing places like Los Angeles, um, rising up very fast, and so it allowed Chicagoans to have this idea that they had this really important place in the history of global culture. Unfortunately, when I arrived, and I went and I took a close look at these buildings, I didn't see the same things that I saw when I looked at those black and white photographs. So I would go to the Marquette building, and I would notice that it has these uh, Taurus moldings and Greek and Roman, uh, the Greek uh, key um, fret on the side there, the, um, the terracotta blocks done in this kind of um, guilloche pattern. This was not an architecture that was trying to get rid of all tradition, all historical styles, and all ornament. It just wasn't, and speaking of getting rid of ornament, um, you could hardly say that about a, a lot of the architecture of Louis Sullivan. Now, um, another really unfortunate byproduct of this kind of history, this narrative, which was so firmly entrenched when I arrived, was that it completely left out buildings like this. Critics like Gideon and Pevsner thought that this was a cultural backwater. And they thought this because it didn't throw out all those conventions. Architects like Graham Anderson, Probst and White, and Holliburn and Root wanted to keep some of the basic ideas of Western culture. In architecture, this meant ideas of proportion that were based on the human form, the, the human body, ideas about ideals of beauty, and the idea of the importance of ornament as explaining what a building was all about. Now, the fact that the broad public really loved these buildings only made it more um, abhorrent to these um, people that were uh, pushing for the avant-garde. Um, one critic, uh, and he was uh, this, this um, epithet that he created for this kind of architecture was one that you saw several times in the literature, called it the perfume bottle style of architecture. Well, you know what that meant. It meant this. It, it meant luxury, sex, drinking, um, naughty high life in Paris in the 1920s. Um, and so the Palmolive building, the Civic Opera building, they got very little love for, for decades in books on architectural history. All of this was based on this extremely suspect notion that starting afresh, completing a completely new vocabulary, was somehow better than using the vocabulary you had, as if you, when you wrote a novel, in order to say something new, you had to invent some new language. So what I did, um, and I should say that um, the, the idea 
that that building, the Palmolive building, which I think is one of the great buildings in America, that somehow it wasn't in the history books where this little, little villa outside in exurban Paris was in all the books. That just seemed to be kind of ridiculous, that um, this was more important than, than this, which is what most Americans would have thought of as being the most important modern architecture of the time, or that, or the Hoover Dam, or these magnificent products of America between the two wars. So when I got to Chicago, the first thing I did was to head to the Chicago Historical Society because I knew they had the archives of Holliburton and Root. And that was the most prolific firm of the 1920s. So I spent several years, quite a few years actually, on this. Um, I did an exhibition at the, History, at the Historical Society. And then I did these uh, three volumes that cataloged the work of the firm. Uh, just this extraordinary work. And fortunately, the records were all there that you could um, put it all into context. I also spent a lot of time lecturing. Now, at these lectures, a funny thing happened. I'd be standing here, and I'd be right in the middle of a sentence, and I'd hear this, this voice coming up from the front row. Did you say Art Deco? And I would patiently explain that I did not say Art Deco advisedly, because Art Deco wasn't a term that was used at the time. And it was a term that was extremely imprecise and obviously a lot of problems with it. I later found out that um, this little um, old lady that was sitting in the front row was a woman named Bonnie Selig. She was obviously hard of hearing, so she moved up as close to the lectern as she could, had a purple coat and a little rabbit pin on her. And then I found out that she was a stalwart of the Chicago Art Deco Society and a great enthusiast for the um, Art Deco. Well. Interestingly enough, um, I think bon uh, Bunny got the last laugh here. Uh, for better or for worse, we scholars can't really dictate how language is used. The public loves that term, Art Deco, and obviously I'm using it now. Now, in fact, as I just mentioned, Art Deco was not a style term that was used during the interwar years. Uh, many other terms were used, particularly terms associated with word modern or modernistic, Art Deco was an invention of the late 1960s. Um, here's the man who really put it on the map, who really popularized it, a man named Bevis Hillier, a journalist in London. And there's his book, um, Art Deco of the 1920s and the 1930s. Now, Hillier grew up in post-war Britain which was probably a very grim place to grow up. It had um, been decimated by the war. There were shortages of all kinds. And so when he compared his Britain to the Britain that he knew of from his grandparents and the Britain of the 1920s and Paris of the 1920s, it seemed like this was a world of color and life that he was really enthous enthusiastic about. And so he um, went out and found these objects these buildings, but mostly products that exemplified to him this really rich cultural legacy. A lot of this was from Vienna and Central Europe, which was really, in many ways, at the forefront of design in the early 20th century. So for example, the famous Palais Stockley in Brussels by the Viennese architect Josef Hoffmann. And here's some um, Hoffmann, uh, Hoffmann tea sets. Now, to be sure, there was also um, a great influence from Paris, particularly in luxury goods. And so when um, Hillier came to do a name, he eventually settled. He could have done all kinds of other names. He could have called the whole style secession, for example, using a, a Viennese term. But what he finally chose was Art Deco after the Exposition Internationale des Arts Décoratifs et Industriels modern, the modern industrial and decorative arts. And this was the kind of thing that was in that exhibition. This exhibition was very forthrightly a chance to try to put France back in the leadership of design in Europe in the 20th century. But unfortunately, because he used this term, a lot of people have thought, and here's um, some of the, the, the French material, a lot of people have thought 
that um, Art Deco was essentially decorative. Well, really, Art Decoratif, all that meant was it was applied art. It wasn't fine art, like painting and sculpture. And they thought that it was mostly from the 1920s and that it was French-inspired luxury goods. And there's still a great deal of, um, of a great many people that think of it that way. Now, um, Art Deco, after this book came out, took off like wildfire. Um, Hillier also created this, curated this exhibition in Minneapolis, um, which again made that association between French-inspired luxury products and Art Deco. Now, to me, this Art Deco revival is really interesting because it's a genuine grassroots um, movement. This, was, this just flew in the face of accepted wisdom. I mean, you can just imagine what Mies van der Rohe must have thought about those perfume bottles and um, all of the other um, objects that were being collected by people like Andy Warhol. So Warhol, both in his um, art and also in his collecting, went out and got the, the, the stuff that was about as far away from accepted minimal modernism as you could possibly find. I think he, I think he and the, the general public who started collecting loved Art Deco because it was as colorful, as decorative, as ornamental as European avant-garde um, design was puritanical and astringent. And it caught on not just in New York, but all over the country, um, here in Chicago, as elsewhere in the country. The first enthusiast tended to be a kind of bohemian set, young people, many artists, a lot of um, gay people. Um, and the first reaction to it was often a camp reaction. Camp meaning that it's, it's so bad that it's good. But with a lot of camp, what happens over time is that that campy attitude changes into genuine admiration. And that happened very quickly with Art Deco. Now, as the, um, this enthusiasm uh, snowballed, the definition kept getting bigger and bigger. I think in the United States particularly, we didn't really have a lot of luxury objects. What we did have, though, was architecture, some spectacular architecture. And so gradually, um, the idea that like the, those um, gargoyles that came off the Chrysler building or this decoration in the lobby, Gradually, the idea of Art Deco transferred from just the ornament to the whole building itself. And this became much more important with the creation of the Art Deco district in Miami Beach. And here, we're no longer talking about French-inspired 1920s. Most of these buildings were from the 1930s, 1940s, even 1950s. And they were in this other style, pretty much um, a completely different style, which was a kind of streamlined style. So this was very influential. This movement was spearheaded by a woman named Barbara Capitman. And Barbara Capitman went around the country proselytizing in favor of Art Deco. And everywhere she went, Art Deco societies sprung up, including one here in Chicago um, in the early 1980s. Now, fast forward to 2012, when I got involved with this project. This book was a, a, a long time desire, a long time goal of the Chicago Art Deco Society. And what um, we decided to do here was to convene a big group of advisors, people who really knew a lot about design history and about Chicago. And we, first of all, tried to decide what we're going to use as a definition from Art Deco. Because Art Deco has always been like, well, it's like pornography. You know it when you see it. Uh, but there's never been a generally agreed upon definition. So we sat around the table, and we tried to um, decide what we're going to do with that. Um, one of the problems was that scholars, like myself, had always avoided it. Uh, so, for example, David Gebhardt was one of the, the most important scholars who actually was looking at this period. And he really didn't like Art Deco. And he didn't like it because it was anachronistic. It didn't, wasn't used at the time. But also because it yoked together what he called the machine or zigzag moderne, 
which is, a type, which is a term he thought would be a useful one, of the 1920s, and the streamlined modern of the 1930s. Now, I think that if these terms had caught on, it would have saved everybody a lot of trouble, and uh, it would, be, uh, would have been a, probably a good thing. But for better or for worse, um, academics don't get to choose um, the words that people use, and Art Deco has been the one that um, has won out. And you still see a lot of the books that come out on Art Deco are about this high-end French luxury design. So for example, um, this book here from 2015, an exhibition in Barcelona, or um, this is an exhibition in Paris itself in 2013. Um, we even debated whether we would remove the, the words Art Deco from the title altogether. Um, we noted, for example, that this exhibition in, at the Cooper Hewitt and the Cleveland Museum did just that. I don't think you can, I don't think there's five times in this whole book that you see the, the term Art Deco. So they called it the Jazz Age to get around that. Now, of course, if you're making a book for the Chicago Art Deco Society, <laughs> removing that, that term from the title would be a hard sell. And I think that we decided that in any case, um, since it had become so popular, and because the definition had become so broad, we would go with that. In fact, we'd push it a little bit further. And so what we did is we, uh, we put up, um, we had up to 400 items that we were considering for the, the key 101 that we were going to ultimately select. And we, we did those first, and we, got, we put them up by how important they were as um, characteristic of the style, how important the authors, the creators were, um, the aesthetic, um, uh, just the aesthetic merit of them, and how important they were in social, economic, political history. So we got them all up, and then we tried to get a definition that would fit them. And what we finally decided we would do is create a big tent definition. We were going to talk about most of the production and design history in the United States between about 1910 and 1960 that wasn't strict historical revival on the one hand or avant-garde on the other hand. And that left a lot of things to look at. It was interesting, th these are the 101, and it was interesting that they broke down rather neatly into the 1920s and the 1930s, with the starting very slowly in the teens and then crescendo into 1928, 29, and 30, when you had this enormous um, outburst of, of design um, enthusiasm. And then in the 30s, because of the Depression, um, you have a, a lean period. And then 1937, 38, 39, once again, surprisingly, this great big efflorescence of design. So let's start with 1920s and the first entry in our book. Now, you can believe that Frank Lloyd Wright scholars do not like to see this in this book. <laughs> they would like to believe that designs of Frank Lloyd Wright came full-blown out of his um, capacious brain. But actually, when you look at the work of Frank Lloyd Wright, for virtually the entire period between the teens and the 50s, it parallels very often Art Deco. And in this particular case, um, this is a wonderful example of Viennese, Central European modernism being reinterpreted in the United States in a way that you look at this and you could think that this is almost from the 1920s. So whether this is proto-deco or it's actual deco, it seemed like a good place to start this. And it also showed us that, that in Chicago, even more than most places, Paris was less important except for a very narrow stratum at the very top of the market than other places, particularly Central Europe. Now, Paris did have a lot of allure, particularly for people in society and people with a lot of money. With people with enough money would go to Paris to buy their fashion, or they could see Paris design through things like this, the French artist Erte. Um, oh, sorry, 1918, I think this is. Um, the French artist Erte doing costumes for uh, Chicago's um, would-be diva, <laughs> Gana Walska. Um, this, this was uh, very much uh, 
the kind of thing that you could see if you, for example, went to the opera. And Chicagoans could buy similar kinds of fashion here, designs that were very much up to the minute and adaptations of what you would see in France, in Paris, in the same year. For example, this um, spectacular engagement dress. I think that it is not surprising that French high style came first in the United States and in Chicago to the high-end products. And so um, it's not surprising that those dress, that dress that we just looked at um, exemplified that. And we had this just absolutely meteoric rise in the town of Elgin, out in the Fox Valley, of accessories that for a very short period between about 1928 and 1931 burst onto the scene with these Parisian watches um, designed by, apparently designed by French couturier and these um, spectacular compact cases by these two um, Elgin companies. But we had very little uh, otherwise of product design in the 1920s. We did have a lot of architecture, though, at the very end of the, of the decade. Uh, we saw a great burst of buildings like, for example, the Powhatan um, with, this, um, design, with these um, ornamentation that came right out of the 1925 Paris Fair. There was also more restrained and refined versions of this. For example, the work by Philip Mayer. And these buildings um, on Astor Street were particularly remarkable for the interiors, which were very often done in that same style. The same fascination with French high style you can see at the casino, uh, the work of the architect Walter Frazier and the legendary Rue Carpenter although it's still quite unclear exactly what Rue Carpenter did. Was she a, really a design professional, or did she walk around and point out uh, curtains are this color and the upholstery here? We, we don't know that, but she clearly had a, a very major influence on the design of many of the Chicago clubs and, pl and other places as well. The two big firms um, were Holliburn and Root and Graham Anderson, Probst and White. They mastered the French academic tradition, which they learned at the Ecole des Beaux-Arts, the, the foremost school for architecture in the Western world. But they brought it, when they brought it back to Chicago, they were applying this to buildings on an unprecedented scale. So it was at once traditional, but completely modern in almost every other, um, in almost every aspect. By the late 1920s, Chicago could also start to claim an even more important place in the history of modern design with mass market goods for the middle class and the working class across the United States. So Sears and Montgomery Wards would send their people to Paris or they would buy Parisian fashion, bring it back here, figure out how to manufacture it so they could sell it for $1.95. And this had a huge effect on American social life. And it's hard for us to even sort of imagine this today with all of the extremely inexpensive clothes you can buy at Target. But really, when you were walking down the sidewalk in the late 1920s, probably for the first time in history, you would see a woman coming towards you in 20 feet away, and you wouldn't know from that distance, whether this was the wife of a millionaire going out to lunch with her friends, or whether this was the wife of a stockyards worker, because the Sears and Montgomery Ward's clothing was, at least at that distance, um, so close to what the uh, most uh, expensive clothing you could buy was. So Chicago here, and I think it's true of Chicago through its entire history, was typically not the place where ideas first started. It certainly was not, it was certainly a, a meat and potato business kind of town. And so the genius of this place seems to have been to take ideas that came from elsewhere, for example, from Paris, and then figure out how to make them less expensive and to market them to this very broad audience all across the United States. Now, 
in the early 1930s, as I've said, there was a major lull as the American economy hit bottom. But to me, I think the biggest surprise in doing this book was to find this great upsurge in design starting in the middle 1930s and to find out that these products were even more widely distributed, had a wider um, a, uh, impact on American society than anything done in the 1920s. Now, was this because of the Depression or in spite of the Depression? And I don't know that we've ever figured that out. The style that dominates the 1930s is the streamlined modern version of Art Deco. Now, this was streamlining was something that was known to everybody, just looking at birds and fish. Um, but engineers in the, already in the 19th century were doing submarines and, and dirigibles and all kinds of other products using streamlining. It really became a, a fashion in the late 1920s. And once again, it comes out of New York, uh, particularly people like Norman Bel Geddes, the famous designer, was uh, put, started doing designs and books that trumpeted this style. We saw here in Chicago um, quite a few examples of this at the um, Century of Progress exhibition in 1933, 1934. Now, this is one of, I think, our, our highlights of this book, uh, one of our great discoveries. We found out about a lot of people who had been almost completely forgotten, but I don't think anyone more important than Everett Worthington, who was really one of the country's most important designers of the 1930s. Unfortunately, he died young. He, was, um, he did a number of exhibits at the 1933 fair. He was about to do even more of them in the 1939 fair, but he died. And there was nobody in his family to take up the tale, and so he was largely forgotten. One of our authors, Bill Meehan in Philadelphia, discovered his archives in Southern California, um, finally got it to the um, Hagley Museum, and we found out that this was a really major figure. So here's his uh, Coca-Cola fountain for the Coca-Cola exhibition. Now, as I say, Chicago's designs, we've um, concluded in the 1930s, had an even greater impact than those of the 1920s. Now, consider for just a moment the impact on the women of the United States. So we're in the 1930s. We've just seen rural electrification um, carried out so that we are having electricity to almost all parts of the country for the first time. You're a farmer's wife. And suddenly, this refrigerator, um, designed by Raymond Lowy of New York, but much cheaper than the competitors, comes on the market and you have electricity and you have enough money to buy this, it just overnight creates a new condition that you can keep all kinds of products, um, even in the height of summer, without fear of their going bad. So it, it created a huge change in the kitchen. And the kitchen and the garage were the two places where we saw modern design coming in strongly. The garage was the realm of Detroit, not of Chicago. But the kitchen was really a Chicago thing. So there was the Sunbeam Mixmaster, which cut down hours of drudgery. By World War II, Chicago products were everywhere in the kitchen. So if we look at this Norman Rockwell cover, uh, we, see the, um, we see the T9, uh, Sunbeam T9 toaster sitting on a dinette set that probably came from the Howell Company. Um, that's probably a coffee pot at a, from a Chicago manufacturer there on the, on the right. Now, Chicago's influence was certainly not confined just to the kitchen. Objects that were designed in Chicago, manufactured in Chicago, and distributed from Chicago, um, this was a remarkable roll call of national design icons. So for example, the Bell 302 model telephone perhaps the single most ubiquitous uh, machine in any American household for decades, um, was not designed here. It was designed in um, the Bell Labs in, in New York and New Jersey. But it was built here exclusively at the Western Electric plant in Cicero, millions of them. The Radio Flyer wagon, 
the Schwinn bicycle. Chicago had the lion's share of fans that were built between the wars. The T9 toaster, we've seen again, probably the best-selling toaster in the history of toasters. Panthers by the Royal Hager Company. Now, we're almost at the end here, and as I was trying to put this talk together, I couldn't quite decide how to end it. So instead of deciding, um, I thought I would use three different endings and let you choose uh, which ones you think is, is the best. Okay, so here's the first one. Uh, this image and, and this product, um, this is a, um, a Sears compressor, portable compressor, uh, in the collection of the Montreal Fine Arts Museum. And it's extraordinary that it's in a museum at all because um, Sears and Montgomery Ward products hardly have made it to any museum, um, certainly not any in Chicago. Um, this is by no means the most famous product that Sears put out in the 1930s, but this was a real favorite for the editors and the authors in our book. And we loved it for two reasons. One is that it was a, a humble product. Um, another was that it, it had a big impact. Um, this portable air compressor you would use if you were, let's say, a homeowner or a, co a contractor, a small contractor, to, let's say, paint the outside of a house. Well, before this came along, this whole line of products, it would have it would have been very expensive to buy the big, heavy, bulky machinery that you would need for such a thing. This just unleashed a torrent of do-it-yourself um, products, projects all over the United States. And the other thing, too, is that this is a, just a spectacularly bold design. These geometric shapes, this bold um, aluminum, cast aluminum set off by the, the red enamel is as beautiful a design as you'll find from the 1920s, 1930s, either from the avant-garde or from the um, manufacturers for the masses. So that's ending number one. Uh, here's, <laughs> here's the second ending, uh, which we would um, end with the hostess Twinkie. Now, the question here, can we genuinely consider this an Art Deco design, a, st a streamlined modern design? And a lot of people, including some on our, our board, we had a lot of fights in our editorial board, would say that um, this was um, just an accidental thing, that it was this way because the molds that they used to create this uh, sponge cake um, were easier to, to take the, the cake out um, after the, the um, if, if it had baked. Um, originally, this had been used for strawberry shortcake. And the idea was that they would open it up, they would fill it with strawberries, but only in season. And so they couldn't use it for half of the year, maybe eight months here in Chicago. Um, and uh, so there, this gentleman um, named uh, Dewar um, that you see up there in Schiller Park um, invented a new kind of pastry that had a cream filling in it that they could sell year around. And yes, it's possible that that shape was there just accidentally because it was easier to take out of the mold. On the other hand, if this, it is kind of surprising that they left it naked, isn't it? That if they hadn't liked that shape a lot, a shape that looked a little bit like a diesel locomotive or like a Zeppelin of the time, they probably would have covered it and put little icing and doodads on it to disguise the shape. But they didn't. They left it naked just like that. So, now the book is out, and um, I think the um, people on the board of CADS were, were terrified that the, the New York Times would review the book, and this would be the very first thing that they would talk about, and <laughs> they would discredit the whole book because of the Twinkie. Okay, now here's number three, ending number three. Um, I never actually talked with Bunny Selig about her own views of Chicago design, um, but Bunny, wherever you are, I hope you're pleased with this book, and I want you to note that this time I really did say Art Deco. So thank you all very much. So, very happy to take. Yeah, we can ask some questions. Mine is, is the Twinkie in the book? 
Twinkie is in the book. Okay. After we, uh, we sat around and debated this up and yeah. down for um, the days, we yeah. finally decided to put it in. I've got one right here. She's kind of behind a column. Um, I have a question. Um, about 15 years ago, the Victoria and Albert Museum did a probably Western right. Art Deco exhibit yes. in which they had two rooms when I saw it in Boston, the Boston Museum of Fine Arts. Um, and they distinguished between early Art Deco, which I don't know what phrase they were calling, but they related it more to Art Nouveau, which had a kind of gestamptum work, a total work of art thing, more decorative aspects, more high-end customization, and then the streamline or modern. I'm not sure the exact terms they used, but they were separating the late teens and the 20s from the 30s. And I'm noticing um, you're not going there. And I'm just wondering what you think of that. Because I think like the um, Opera House in Chicago looks like late Art Nouveau as much as early Art Deco. Right. No, I think that, um, that those comments are exactly on the mark. Uh, that 2003 Victoria and Albert um, show was absolutely remarkable that they did it because, as I say, the scholars uh, disdained the term. And so for them to actually use it um, was remarkable. Now, they did still, I mean, they had things from the 30s and streamlined, but it was primarily from the 1920s. And the particular interest they had um, and if you, if you want to go online, there's a little film that the V&A puts up, was um, still the exotic. Um, it was um, uh, about Africa and about uh, new sexual mores and drinking and smoking and women being out in public for the first time. So it was, it was very distinctly about a kind of high life um, was the, the main thrust of it, even though, to their credit, there was a lot else in there. Yes, they did distinguish between 1920s and 1930s. We do it a little less. Um, and I think in retrospect, just as I was talking about it, I realized that maybe we should have made a bigger separation there. Uh, but um, yeah, a good comment. I'm going to bring you the microphone over here. Thanks. Um, you talked a little bit about the process for deciding what went into the book, but I was wondering if you could just talk a little bit more about the process of pulling it together. It's my understanding that it's taken like close to 10 years or something to get this done, and um, how you decided like, you know, what aspects of Chicago's contributions to include and all of that and how you gathered the material. Yeah, um, well, this was really something that the Chicago Art Deco Society wanted to do from the very beginning. And they started trying to do a survey, then the survey grew. Eventually, they got some money from the Driehaus Foundation to do a double issue of the magazine on the 1933-34 fair. And then finally, under the current um, president, Joe Lowndy, um, the thing increased in scope. and. Um, uh, they had uh, uh, someone named Keith Bringy who um, went all around the city on his bicycle um, taking photographs. And Keith it was who really decided that it was going to include design. So it was the whole universe of, of form from the 1920s and 1930s. Then I came aboard. Uh, I was asked to write an introduction. And I figured, well, I've written all this on Holliburton and Root. And so I can certainly knock this introduction off in a week. Um, well, uh, as, may, as these things go, it, it turned out that the, uh, they really didn't, at, at CADS, which is a small volunteer organization, they just didn't have the expertise to do a major book. So I finally agreed to step in as editor. But the trouble there was that I, I had no idea that there was all that stuff out there, like these, these radios and the Shure microphone, and, and nobody knew about anything about them. And so we had to go find people that could write about them. And we couldn't find them among scholars. We had scholars like Neil Harris and others who wrote um, very, very well on some aspects. But when you wanted to find out about the Radio Flyer Wagon, for example, there was nobody out there that had really studied that. So we had to find people like collectors and enthusiasts and just people who would spend the time going looking for these things. And in the process, 
uh, we made a lot of discoveries, um, and but it was it was a it was like an extraordinarily slow and difficult process because these collectors would know everything there was to know about the tubes inside that Motorola radio. <laughs> the scholars knew what Baudrillard said about consumption in the, in the 2020s and 30s, but trying to get those two things together was just an incredible task. So that's why it really took five years of just about constant um, day in, day out, 60 hours a week, trying to finally get the thing together. One of the, the most gratifying things about this, bes besides all these discoveries and the people who found each other through the process, was that there is now a group, we had over 40 authors, there is now a big group of Chicagoans who have had the experience of writing, serious writing for a publication like this. And this is really important because New York and Los Angeles have a lot more outlets. And so I think this was a great thing for the criticism, history, theory of all of this material. Is there any one city that you think deserves the title Art Deco Capital of America? No, I think um, the cities differ. I think there are a lot of cities that could lay claim to the title, but for very different reasons. Obviously, Hollywood and Los Angeles. Obviously, Detroit and um, for automobiles. Uh, New York always had a much bigger um, industrial capacity than Chicago. Um, it turns out that the only other book that's even remotely um, like the one that we did in terms of product design came from Toledo, of all places. And uh, when you look through it, you're just astonished at the things that came out of Toledo, uh, the design that came out of Toledo. So I think you could probably find at least a dozen places. And it's surprising that, that Tulsa has remarkable architecture. And you can go around the world because this was, in some ways, this was the real international style. This was a thing that you can find in, in Mumbai and in Christchurch in New Zealand, um, as well as Chicago and, and Boston. So um, I think even more than the international style we know of European avant-garde, this was an international style. Thank you. I, I think it was Brian Hillier who came up with the term Art Deco. Bevis, Bevis oh, Hillier. OK, mm -hmm. Bevis. So in the second cover that you showed, that really reminded me of a Peter Max poster. Oh, yes. And then that, in conjunction with the Andy Warhol cookie jars, prompts me to think that maybe pop art is sort of an evolution of Art Deco. Yes. These, these things happen simultaneously and for the same reason. Um, pop art, super graphics, um, op art, um, all of this was a, at the same time as the art, the revival of Art Deco, and by the way, the revival of Victorian architecture. All of this came at the same time in the 60s and the 1970s and was a big revolt against established minimal modernism of the Mies and Bauhaus kind. And when you, when you, your observation about the, that cover is exactly right, that in, particularly in the 1970s, 1980s, there was what we could call Echo Deco, which was a Art Deco revival that you saw a lot in graphic design, um, but also in architecture. The NBC building here was a fairly good example of that. So yes, that's exactly right, that these things were happening at exactly the same time for the same reason. I don't know if you've read the book, uh, the, uh, the Rise and Fall of Chicago, The Third Coast. Um, Third but, Coast, uh, yes. She makes a great argument that there were political movements and decisions that really determined the, much of how architecture, at least uh, in terms of city planning, uh, took place in Chicago. And I wonder if, if you deal, deal, dealt with that in the book, or is this purely an aesthetic approach? 
Um, no, we certainly tried to deal with the uh, social, political, economic uh, background. The, the book by Thomas Dijon is a wonderful book. It's largely about uh, post-war, but and, and he does a, a big introductory part, um, which interestingly enough is um, very much not what we were doing. He, he takes the standard line about the, the modernists. Um, and so we, we went in a very different way. But yes, that's a, that's a very good book. And, and our goal was exactly that. We found, less we found a whole lot of impact on the economy and on social life. We did not find a lot of concordance back and forth with politics. There, Are there any other questions? There's oh, one in the up front. Here. I, I'm just curious. I never would have thought that the Palmolive building was Art Deco. Could you just tell me what makes that Art Deco? Well, originally, what happened here was the if if you go in if you went inside before they um, had remodeled it, you would have seen uh, on the elevator doors and you would have seen ornament that was clearly Art Deco that was related to the products. And as I said, what happened then was that eventually the entire building started to be thought of as Art Deco because it was quite different from everything that had come before. Before, they tended to be blocky buildings. And then they, in the skyscraper style with the setbacks, it becomes a kind of a three-dimensional object that you can see from all sides and from above. And so the, um, the I, I don't know whether if it hadn't been for that specific ornament, that many of these buildings would actually have been called deco because in many ways they're classical buildings. But because there was that, um, that uh, correspondence between the decoration and the building massing, and then what happened was that you got clocks and radios and all kinds of other objects that were done in the new Catalan plastics and all kinds of, of these new shiny materials that then firmly put the, the skyscrapers into that visual world that we call Art Deco. All right, thank you so much, Bob.